then she comes, she comes back. Yes. My, my lady, if you may please you in the matter, my name is Kuyuni. I appear with Mr. Mbarak Awa for the Speaker of the National Assembly and the 13th respondent and the National Assembly, the 15th respondent. Mm. My lady, I would like to place on record, my lord, the documents we have filed on behalf, my lady, of the National Assembly and the Speaker of the National Assembly. And my lord and my ladies, we have filed some missions. And the submissions are dated the 14th day of December 2021. At the outset, my lady and my lords, we would like to uh, state that we are supporting the appeals by the first appellant and the appeal by the second appellant. And we fully associate ourselves, my lady and my lords, with the submissions made therein by the council for the first and second appellants. And secondly, my lady and my lords, uh, the directions issued by the court on 9th of November 2021, this honorable court framed seven issues emanating from the consolidated petitions. The Speaker of the National Assembly and the National Assembly will be addressing three issues. My Lord and my ladies, the first issue that we'll be addressing is whether the basic structure doctrine is applicable in Kenya. this into context, my lady, uh, and to appreciate the basic structure doctrine, it's important to first look at the history and the origin of the doctrine. The basic structure doctrine, my lady and my lords, has its origin in India, and specifically uh, the Kesavanamba Barati case, my lord, which has been extensively cited. And the doctrine is concerned mainly with limiting the power of parliament to make amendments to the constitution. It does not address issues of amendments through the public, uh, uh, popular initiative. So, at paragraph 12 for some submission, my lady and my lords, we have cited a number of cases to support our position that the basic structure doctrine is not concerned with the popular initiative and is only and only addresses amendments uh, to the constitution through parliament and our submissions before this court today my lady and my lords is that it is not applicable in Kenya. Although we admit, my lords and my ladies, that the constitution of Kenya has uh, the, uh, its basic structure, which I will call the building blocks. And the building blocks of the constitution of Kenya are those that are contained in Article 255 of the constitution. Therefore, my lords and my lady, we admit that it has a basic structure. My lord, I will also address you on the uh, on extent if the basic structure doctrine limits the power of amendment. And my question, my lords and my ladies, to that question, my answer to that question is that it does not limit the power of amendments. The Constitution, Chapter 16, is self-contained. It's self-executing. 
It has provisions on how to amend each and every article of the Constitution. And therefore, there is no need at all of invoking the basic stru structure doctrine. In any case, my lords and my ladies, the Constitution itself, under Article 255, already provides safety, uh, safety valves on the amendments through the parliamentary initiative. That is also a reason why the basic structure doctrine is not applicable. Our submission, therefore, is that uh, the power of the people to amend the Constitution flows directly from the Constitution itself, specifically Article 1, sub Article 1 and 2 of the Constitution. That right, my lords and my ladies, cannot be limited, either by the, the, the court or even the Constitution itself, my lord. The people are supreme, much more supreme, my lord, than the Constitution itself. What the high, uh, Court of Appeal and High Court Judgments did is placing the Constitution above the people that it's supposed to govern. My Lord, that we come before you, my Lord, asking you to correct that error by the superior courts. My Lords and my Lady, the second issue that we would like to address you on is whether the President can initiate changes and amendments to the Constitution. My Lord, we have read the Constitution, specifically uh, Article 255 to 257. We have not found any constitutional backing or foundation to the finding of the court that the President or any other state official is precluded or discriminated from initiating amendments to the Constitution. And therefore, my Lord, it's our submission that it's not prohibited in the Constitution. And if it's not prohibited, my Lord and my ladies, then it is allowed. <clears throat> that is, my Lord, our submission on the second issue. My Lord, just to add to that, my Lord, the President, uh, uh, a person being elected president does not lose any rights that he had before. And I will refer you, my Lord, to Article 137, 1A and C of the qualification on the qualifications for election of a president. And one of the qualifications is the president must be a, zit a citizen of the country. At what point, my Lord and my Lady, does he lose that right mm. such that he can initiate uh, constitutional amendments? My third issue, my lord and my lady, is the place of public participation in respect of the constitutional amendment bill 2020. Public participation, my lords and my lady, is a very paramount element of our constitution. It's provided in Article 10, 118, and almost every other article of the constitution, including Article 257. My Lord, public participation in respect of the Constitution of Amendment Bill is a continuous process. And it starts, my Lord and my ladies, from the collection of the one million signatures. You start engaging the public from the day, you go back to, you go, you go to, uh, to them and asking them to sign the document. It, it then proceeds to the county assemblies, and county assemblies are obligated to also conduct public participation. And if the county assemblies pass the bills, it goes to parliament. And parliament, again, are also supposed to uh, conduct public participation. And on behalf of the National Assembly, I do confirm that uh, public participation was extensively carried out, especially by parliament, in respect of the Constitution of Amendment Bill 2020. And therefore, my lords and my ladies, public participation 
in a constitutional amendment is not a single day event. It's a continuous process that starts from the collection of signatures and ends at the referendum stage. It is therefore wrong to look at public participation as a single event and isolate it, my lords and my ladies, from what uh, has been done before the bill is presented to the public. And my lords and my ladies, uh, a last issue, I'm just trying to run through the issues, my lords and my ladies, because most of the issues have been submitted on, is whether the interpretation of Article 257.10 of the Constitution entails and requires that all proposed amendments to the Constitution should be submitted, submitted as separate and distinct referendum questions. My Lord, we submit that the third appellant, my Lord, who is the proponent of that uh, suggestion, is wrong. Article 257.10 does not require all specific proposed amendments to be submitted as separate and distinct referendum questions. Uh, both Article 256 on parliamentary initiative, 257 on popular initiative, require, make reference to a bill that is either approved or rejected. There is no requirement at all <clears throat> for separate and distinct uh, referendum questions. And therefore, my lords and my lady, we submit that the Constitution itself does not uh, uh, speak about uh, distinct and separate uh, referendum questions. It, st it speaks about a bill. Therefore, my lords and my lady, we ask you to uphold the ruling of the Court of Appeal to that effect, that there is no requirement for separate and distinct uh, uh, referendum questions. For those few remarks, my lords and my ladies, we wish to uh, urge you to allow the appeals by the first and second respondents and uh, dismiss the appeal by the third respondent. Mm -hmm. I note that I still have around six minutes, my lord. I would like to donate them to my colleague for the Senate, Mr. Ambulu. Mm -hmm. Thank you, my lord. The, your leadership and your lordship. My name is uh, Job Wambulua. I appear together with Ms. Masi Tanji for the Senate and uh, the Speaker of the Senate who are the 14th and the 16th respondents in these consolidated appeals. From the onset, your leadership and uh, lordships, we wish to associate ourselves with the submissions made by the Attorney General, the IEBC, and my friend Mr. Kuyoni, and other respondents that will submit in support of the two appeals. We will be submitting on uh, four issues. And the first issue that will be, uh, before we submit all the issues, we filed our submissions are dated 10 December 2021. And the first issue that we should be submitting on is the issue of applicability of the basic structure doctrine in Kenya. And my lord and my ladies, when you look at the judgment of the Court of Appeal, the court upheld the finding of the High Court that the basic structure doctrine is applicable in Kenya and that the same doctrine limits the amendment powers under Articles 255 to 257 and the same can only be uh, amended can only be altered through the primary constituent powers which must include the four sequential steps of civic education 
public participation and collection of views, constituent assembly, and ultimately a referendum. The import of that finding, my lords and my ladies, is that the court elevated our constitution to the level of a holy book. We believe that it's only a holy book that cannot be amended, cannot be changed. We have to believe what is there and trust what is there. When you look at that and look at how this doctrine has been applied in other jurisdictions, starting from India, in the Kesavananda case, in the Minerva Mills case, and so on, you'll find that first, this case, this doctrine was in the jurisdictions where it has been applied, was mostly concerned with limiting parliament power to amend the constitution. And also to note that in most of those jurisdictions, just like in our previous constitution, parliament had unlimited powers to amend any part of the constitution and their powers to amendment were limited. Therefore, it was very important for the courts to come in and limit or at least protect the basic tenets of the constitution. That cannot be said to be the case with our Kenyan constitution. Looking at the history of Kenya, the framers of the constitution were aware of those challenges that were there, the abuse that was there, and indeed, the parliament's power is now so much limited when it comes to amendment of the constitution. <coughs> Another issue that arises out of this is that you'll find that this doctrine itself has even received mixed receptions all over the world. There are those countries which jurisdictions have accepted this doctrine, there are those ones which have rejected it. And even amongst the legal and academic scholars, as you'll see from the Amish briefs that are before you, that they do not even agree amongst themselves. There are those who urge caution in the applicability and reception of that doctrine. There are those who say that this doctrine is applicable. That indicates that this is a raging debate. This is not a settled debate. Therefore, experimenting and the way the Court of Appeal, with due respect, applied that doctrine poses various challenges going forward for our country. In this regard, therefore, we submit that although our Kenyan constitution has a basic structure that has been identified under Article 255, one, with entrenched provisions or thematic areas that before you amend those areas, you must go through the people. Because under Article 1, the people are supreme. They are, they are, they are sovereign. And that sovereignty, therefore, where you want to amend those aspects which Kenyans consider to be core, you have to go back to the people for approval. We therefore submit that the basic structure doctrine is not applicable in Kenya, but the Kenyan constitution has a basic structure that can be identified from Article 250.5.1. The same cannot be inferred. It is provided for in the constitution. As to whether the basic structure of our constitution can only be altered through the primary constituent powers. We disagree, humbly disagree with the uh, finding of the superior courts in this regard. Because the court gave us four sequential steps that we have to follow for we to amend what was considered as a basic structure. And there lies a problem. When you look at uh, these four steps and first of all by uh, looking at uh, the constant primary constant powers and looking at going through the civic education public participation and collection of views constant assembly and debate and also a referendum 
you'll find that even our own constitution we are having now, the said processes were not followed because they are equated. Professor Rosnai, I think, defines a uh, constituent power to mean power to constitute a, a constitution to form like to make like making a constitution. Therefore, the same steps that are used to make a constitution. What the court is telling us that you have to follow the same steps when you want to amend a basic structure of the constitution. And this case, while these arguments are good and raises very important academic debates, the same poses challenges. And these challenges are one, that it is very difficult based on the judgment of the Court of Appeal, to identify specifically what a basic structure is of our constitution. And if you cannot be able to identify, that will mean that whenever anyone will want to amend the constitution, what do you do? Maybe you rush to court and ask the court, I want to amend this aspect of the constitution. Does it concern a basic structure? Secondly, even as I've mentioned before that even our own constitution that we are having now we are trying to protect that it was not, it did not go through the said processes and amendments to the constitution are necessary to respond to situations or changing circumstances in every jurisdiction therefore by including a whole chapter on amendment of the constitution it was not by default, it was not by mistake that therefore you include a whole chapter in the constitution then you tell the people that you know what you cannot amend what we consider as a basic structure you can only use these processes under chapter 16 probably to correct some errors or some minor issues and this process includes even collecting one million signatures going to the people to vote in a referendum probably spending millions and millions of Kenyan money only to correct maybe some errors or a few issues in the constitution. I don't think that was the intention of the framers of the constitution. We submit, my lords and my ladies, that Article 255 and the constitution in general, when you look at the amendment powers under Chapter 16, that it has inbuilt safeguards against abuse or against hyper, hyper amendments and this therefore the court had in introducing some other safeguards that were not contemplated in the constitution and therefore when you look at the failed attempt since the 2010 constitution was promulgated we've had about more than 20 attempts to amend the constitution both through parliamentary initiative and also through popular initiative. That indicates that the, pro the constitution itself can protect itself. We do not need any other measures outside what is provided for in the constitution for we to protect the constitution. And further, we submit that this, there is no provision. When you look at Article uh, chapter 16 of the Constitution, there is no provision in our Constitution that is out of reach of the amendment powers of the Constitution, provided the procedure laid down in the Constitution has been followed. People have sovereign power running through from the preamble, preamble Article 1, that they have the sovereign power to decide how they want to be governed, to decide the form of governance they want to take, so on. Therefore, on this issue, we conclude by saying that if indeed uh, the framers of the Constitution could have intended to limit that article, uh, to limit the amendment powers that will make some art, uh, articles of the Constitution some aspect of our constitution to be unamendable, we think that they will have provided so in the constitution. In summary, we submit, therefore, that the basic structure doctrine is not applicable in Kenya. Two, that the constitution of Kenya 
has a basic structure that has been identified by thematic areas in Article 255.1. Three, that Chapter 16 of the Constitution has no express an amendable, or the Constitution as a whole has no express an amendable provisions, and finally, that there is no implied limitation to amendment powers under chapter 16 or in the constitution the second issue that i'll briefly highlight is as to whether the president can initiate changes or amendments to the constitution and whether a constitutional amendment can only be initiated through parliament under article 256 or through a popular initiative under article 257 from the onset we submit that the Constitution has no preclusion for any person, body, be it public, private, <coughs> or a class of people, to promote constitutional amendment through a popular initiative, provided the procedure that has been laid down under Article 257 has been met. The only requirement we find under Article 257 is that the promoter has to get support of 1 million signatures. Secondly, there is no provision that supports the finding that state actors be limited to the use of the parliamentary initiative route and non-state actors to use popular initiative route. Every person can use popular initiative route to amend the constitution and at the same time every citizen as provided for under article 119 of the constitution can petition parliament to consider any matter within its mandate including amendment to the constitution. Therefore, nothing even stops uh, common citizenry from petitioning parliament to, con uh, to deal with amendments to the constitution. At the same time, there is no guarantee that when parliament wrote, parliament, that parliament will always accede to your request. They might consider your request for amendment and reject it. And even the executive, you bring a bill to amend the constitution and the parliament has that mandate, they'll consider it and might agree with you or might disagree with you and reject that proposal. Therefore, it is our submission that the constitution introduced popular initiative route, not to limit it to the common citizenry, but to guard against the monopoly of parliament on constitutional amendments. The Speaker of the Senate and the Senate therefore rightly submit that the right of amendment by popular initiative under Article 257 of the Constitution is open to any person, including the President, including politicians, including public servants, and the common public. And we find that humbly find that the interpretation of Article 256 and 257 on popular initiative runs contra to what Article 259 provides, which obligates the Constitution to be interpreted in a manner that promotes its purpose, values, and principles, and also to advance the rule of law human rights, fundamental freedoms, and permit the development of law and to contribute to good governance. On the third issue, as to whether the place of public participation under Article 10, vis-a-vis -vis the role of IBC under Article 257.4 of the Constitution, and there whether there was public participation in respect to the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020, we submit that Article 10 obligates or uh, makes a public participation a value and a principle of governance. 
When you consider Article 2, 118 1B, it imposes an obligation on Parliament to facilitate public participation and involvement of the people in all its legislative and other businesses. The same applies to counter assemblies under Article 196 1B, which imposes uh, which requires that there shall be public participation at the county level. When you look at Article 257, it's a framed in a manner that ensures public participation runs through every stage of amendment through a popular initiative. This starts with collection of uh, 1 million signatures. We believe that before you collect 1 million signatures, 1 million people should be aware of why they are giving their signatures for. Secondly, when the bill is submitted to IBC and the IBC takes that bill to the counter assemblies, they are obligated to carry out public participation under Article 196 1B. The same applies when it comes to Parliament. Under Article 118 and also Article 256, it requires Parliament to carry out public participation. And ultimately, when this bill goes to the people in a referendum, the people will participate. We therefore submit that the participation of the public in a constitutional amendment through popular initiative is a continuous process. It's not a single event that should be looked at in isolation of other stages. In this regard, we find or we submit humbly that the constitution should be interpreted holistically and purposively by looking at public participation as involving all these stages. And therefore, as to whether there was public participation in respect to the Constitutional Amendment Bill 2020, the same can only be determined by interrogating all the stages of public participation in amendment process through a popular initiative. The last point that I wish to submit on is with regards to the issue raised by the third petition, that appellant, Mr. Moraro Moke, as to whether interpretation of Article 257.10 of the Constitution entails and or requires that all proposed amendments to the Constitution should be submitted as separate and distinct referenda questions. From the onset, we oppose the petitioner's assertion and submit that the learned judges of the Court of Appeal did not err in holding that Article 25710 of the Constitution does not require specific proposed amendments to the Constitution to be submitted as separate and distinct referendum questions to the people. Why do we say so? When you look at Article 256 and 257, your lordships and your ladyships, on popular initiative, it makes reference to, a, reference to a bill that is either approved or rejected by parliament and depending on what, on the subject being amended, submitted to IBC, to the president and the IBC to hold a national referendum for the approval of the bill. In particular, when you look at Article 256, 5A, it clearly states that if a bill to amend this constitution proposes an amendment relating to a matter specified in 255.1, the president shall be first sending to the bill request the independent electoral boundaries commission to conduct within 90 days a national referendum for the approval of the bill. It doesn't talk about a question. It talks about approval of the bill. In this case, therefore, we find or we submit that there is no requirement for separate referenda, uh, separate 
and distinct referenda questions, and the learned judges of the Court of Appeal clearly interpreted Article 257.10. In summary, therefore, we urge this Honorable Court to correct the error submitted by the Court of Appeal and the High Court and uphold the prayers by the Attorney General and by the IBC and to dismiss the appeal by Mr. Moraro Moke. On the remaining issues that we did not submit on, we associate ourselves with the submissions made by the AG, Attorney General, and the IBC and other respondents that we be supporting their appeals. I wish to rest there, my lords and my ladies. Thank you. The, the remaining five minutes, my lord and my ladies, I'll donate to the Honorable Patron General in their rejoinder. Okay. Okay. Um, next from our own list, we find like um, the 17 the last for that. Is supporting the appeal by the first and second appellants. Are we correct? If not, there is the 19. Or whoever is supporting can take the floor. Submissions for the seven, for the eighteenth and and twenty-first respondents. I shall be submitting with Mr. Jackson Awele and Mr. Arnold Ocheng, but our senior, uh, Mr. James Rengo, will want to make a closing remark after those three presentations. Mm -hmm. We shall share the thirty minutes. I, I will ask then, when I am ready to hand over to the next presenter, then that the. Mm -hmm. Uh, clock be stopped then. My lady, my lords, I, I will begin first by wanting in our view to characterize how we view uh, the basic structure doctrine. Mm. And, and I want to use the words of uh, Justice, Justice Barrow in uh, the case of Richardson versus Mellish, an old case of 1824. And, and the words I would use to describe the basic structure doctrine is that it is a very unruly horse, and once you get astride, you will never know where it is going to carry you. And, and I want to give the reasons why we view the basic structure doctrine uh, as, as a very unruly horse. One, this doctrine does not have any agreed on jurisprudence. It, it, it began as, as a theory by a, a German philosopher, uh, Dietrich Conrad, and this is way before it was picked up by the Supreme Court in India. But even when it was picked up by the Supreme Court in India, it was employed for purposes of reading limitations to the power of amendment of the Indian Parliament. But if you look at the way it is argued today by the New Age philosophers, the Yaniv Rosnai and the rest, it has looked more as upholding some parts of the Constitution as sacrosanct. So one of the things then one does is there a universal jurisprudence that one can say you are following whenever you are employing the basic structure doctrine. And, and our submission is that the basic structure doctrine is too many things to too many people. It, it depends very much always on who wants to use it. Uh, and in this case, it's a horse that will take you only where you, sometimes to where you don't want it to go. Uh, in Kenya, when it, it was employed, it is taken beyond the way it was in Casavananda, and it's now a limitation to the overall powers of amendment under Chapter 16. So in Kenya, it goes beyond targeting uh, parliament, it goes beyond targeting county assemblies, and, and becomes an overall limitation, uh, meaning that then we have to start looking at some parts of the Kenya constitution as sacrosanct. 
and, and not open to amendment regardless of the institution. But that then brings the second question, which was also faced by the High Court. Is, is there any agreement, any universal agreement today as to what are the basic, what, what, are, what are things that are basic about a constitution? Uh, the world has agreed on particular constitutional rights. We have universal declaration of human rights. We have declarations of economic, social, and political rights. The fact that we have agreed on that, do they, are they basic structure to everybody? Is there a requirement in, in law, in international constitutional jurisprudence that, that these rights, because they are agreed on at the United Nations, are rights that must be protected? So, and, and when the High Court was asked what the basic structure of the Kenyan constitution is, it wasn't able to answer that. In fact, if you read the judgment, uh, they seem to almost say that the basic structure is everything in the constitution because the judge said that it extends from chapter 1 to chapter 18. So throughout every place where this doctrine has been employed, nobody has been able to agree on what universally can be determined to be basic structure and what is being protected. Which then brings in the third thing. Uh, does basic structure come by the very existence of a constitution? So, for instance, the American constitution started off without a bill of rights. Did it have a basic structure then, or did it acquire a basic structure when it got its bill of rights? Do the constitutions of China, of Iran, of Russia, of Saudi Arabia, do they have basic structures? Or, or do we have to first identify a particular kind of constitution which has particular elements to it, which we then say that we are now going to apply basic structure doctrine because you now have the kind of constitution uh, that, that can be said to have basic structure. And so that we are able then to set aside uh, this constitution that we believe uh, promote uh, constitutionalism and human rights and, and also be set aside other constitutions that we possibly must view as being substandard and decide then that basic structure only applies to particular constitutions because otherwise you would have to go and say that the constitution of Saudi Arabia has a basic structure. And if that is so, then what is that basic structure? Is it those rights that we agreed at the United Nations? And, and I'm still making the point of how nebulous uh, and, and uh, this doctrine is, how it applies, no laws apply to it. It, it is all over the place. And, but if you, if you compare this with possibly Hans Kelsen theory of, uh, for instance, uh, Grunnum, he, there's a kind of an, an attempt to have an objective test uh, of, of how you can identify when, when there has been a Grunnum. And, and that test has even been universally, in all the cases that uh, his theories have been put up, you can see the similar tests being applied to, to determine something. Uh, the, the cases of Expert Matovu, the cases of Landerberg, you see the same test being applied from the sayings of a philosopher and being able to reach uh, a, a, an end, a, a decision. I, I do not know how much of that you can say about basic structure doctrine. W what are these tests, what are the objective tests, uh, the objective rules that, that one uh, can use on it? Now, you get the same problem then also when you go to dealing with primary constituent power and secondary constituent power. Uh, and, and these terms seem to suggest that people's sovereignty does acquire some subordinate status depending on how it is used. So that they say that once you have made a constitution, then you leave your primary constituent power. You, you kind of are left with some subordinate sovereignty. I, I do not think people's sovereignty can be judged in that way. Uh, but first, it, it begins from the point of assuming that there is a way, an accepted way, a best practice as to how constitutions come into being. Uh, and, and you see that throughout the High Court and the Court of Appeal in these cases. The, the talk of the Constituent Assembly, the talk is as if there is an agreed way in which constitutions might come. But we've seen constitutions come all over the world, brought even by military regimes, constitutions brought in by coup d'etats. The constitution is brought in after civil wars. So there is no agreed way that a constitution in the world comes into being. So at what point then do we start talking about constituent assembly? And even if you go to the arguments about constituent assembly, there's no agreed, actually even uh, an agreed uh, acceptance of what a constituent assembly is. 
There are countries where it is parliaments that have reconstituted themselves as constituent assemblies. So when the High Court says that Kenya must start by first constituting a constituent assembly, what does that mean? And how shall we convene this constituent assembly? Shall we elect it? Is it going to be a delegate system? Uh, is it, are they going to be appointed by, by parliament? Because that is, those are rules uh, that, uh, you know, that, that have not been agreed on. And, and if you even try to make the holding of, uh, of, of uh, constituent assembly to be the best practice, then we are going to have to totally review also theories like those of Hans Kelsen, who says, how do you tell whether a constitution is good or not? He, his answer to that is purely political. He does not answer it from the basis that this constitution came in through the constituent assembly. He only asks the question whether the constitution is in control, whether it is efficacious, and, and whether it has a grown norm. And once you answer those political questions to Hans Kelsen, then you have a constitution. So how do we play this basic structure doctrine in the light of all the other constitutional theories that, that there are? So uh, lastly, I, all I want to say is that we must warn ourselves against the romanticism of, uh, of the jurisprudence in basic structured doctrine. And, and it, as a philosophy, it, it's very alluring. You, you, when you read it, it's, it's very charming, it's very enchanting. But the more you read it, the more you realize what kind of chaos it can cause to a constitutional order. And that is why we are warning that it is an unruly horse, and we do not know where this country is going to take this country if this country remains at stride this philosophy. And for that reason, it is our prayer that your lordships will lift this country from the saddle of this horse uh, and avoid the chaos that it can bring to our jurisprudence. Thank you. My lady, the Chief Justice, my lady, the Deputy Chief Justice, my lords, and my lady, the Justices of the Supreme Court. My role today will be to highlight to you the salient issues that arise in our written submissions with respect to issues number two and number three in the list of issues your as settled. Your name, please, for sake of uh, recording. I beg your pardon? My your name. name. Yeah, for sake of my recording. apologies. My name is Jackson Awele for the 18th and 21st respondents. My lords, with respect to the first issue, and that is the question of whether the president can initiate changes or amendments to the constitution, and this issue is two-pronged. The second um, issue or sub-issue arising therein is whether a constitutional amendment can only be initiated by parliament through a parliamentary initiative under Article 256 of the Constitution or through a popular initiative under Article 257 of the Constitution, our very brief answer to both those questions is that yes, my lords, the President can initiate changes or amendments to the Constitution and that indeed a constitutional amendment may be initiated by Parliament via Articles 256 and 257 of the Constitution and we venture to add that the same may be initiated by any person. We say so for the following reasons, my lord. The Constitution of Kenya recognizes three ways of amending it. One is by popular initiative via the Articles 255, as read with Article 257 of the Constitution. The second is through parliamentary initiative via the Articles 256.1 of the Constitution. And the third is a somewhat hybrid parliamentary stroke popular initiative specifically provided for under Article 256.5 of the Constitution. Who can initiate an amendment by popular initiative and how to do so is clearly defined under Article 257 and is identified simply as a promoter. No further or other definition, my lords, is preferred under the Constitution or indeed any other law as to who a promoter is or is not. In essence, we submit 
that who a promoter is should be permissively construed so that any person, and we lay emphasis on this, any person who can meet the procedural sequential threshold set out under Article 257 of the Constitution, that is to say, proposes an amendment to the Constitution by the general suggestion or a draft bill and gets the said proposal signed by at least one million registered voters on voters on a strict application of Article 257 of the Constitution should qualify as a promoter and would therefore be said to have initiated an amendment to the Constitution. Similarly, amendments to the Constitution by parliamentary initiative under Article 256.1 of the Constitution and under Article 256.5 of the Constitution, what I refer to as a hybrid parliamentary stroke popular initiative, are by dint of the Constitution itself not an exclusive preserve of members of Parliament or indeed any other person. This argument, my lords, finds basis in Articles 109.5 and 119.1 of the Constitution, both of which prescribe who may introduce a bill in Parliament. Under Article 109.5, a member or committee of the relevant House of Parliament may introduce a bill in Parliament. Under Article 119.1 of the Constitution, every person has a right to petition Parliament to enact legislation. The long and short of that submission, my lords, is that any person, without any limitation whatsoever, may propose an amendment to the Constitution, including of an Article 255 matter, via the, a bill which would then be dealt with pursuant to Article 256.5 of the Constitution. In the case of the President, he will be doing so not because he is a state officer, but because he, as every other Kenyan, enjoys all the rights, rights and privileges reserved for citizens under the Constitution of Kenya. Indeed, as rightly submitted by Maladin Senior Mr. Karori, he is the president because he is a citizen first. Evidently, therefore, my lords and my ladies, there is no basis in the face of the Constitution nor in the documented history of its making that supports the conclusion reached by the learned judges of the High Court and the Court of Appeal to the effect that the Constitution created bifurcated tracks, one of which was intended for state officers and the other for ordinary citizens. Such a bifurcation, bifurcation my lords, if cemented and or etched in our jurisprudence, portends serious absurdities that would contradict some of the very basic values and principles that underpin our constitutional architecture and design, and indeed our democracy. This, if I may give examples, would include Articles 1, 27, and 37 of the Constitution that declare the people as the sovereign, as supreme. Article 2, 27, that declare equality of every person before the law and Article 37 that guarantees political rights for every person, irrespective of stature. We set out, we have set out, my lords, for your benefit, these absurdities in extenso in our submissions before the Court of Appeal and in our submissions before this Court, and we trust that you will have ample time to consider the same. May I add that I concur fully with the submissions of my learned senior, Mr. Karori, who set out some of these contradictions and absurdities um, in the event that um, that, uh, that reasoning of the Court of Appeal is to be upheld. As a matter of fact, my lords and my ladies, if it was the intention of the drafters of the 2010 Constitution, well aware of the history of abuse of the amendment power of the Constitution under the previous Constitution by parliamentarians and the executive, that that right should be limited, nothing would have been easier than for them to expressly say so. Finally, my lords, on this issue, we reiterate that much as the President had the right and indeed power to propose amendments to the Constitution by way of popular initiative, the impugned amendments were in fact initiated by Honorable Junet Mohammed and Mr. Dennis Waweru. We urge your Lordships to avoid the trap that the learned judges of the High Court and Court of Appeal fell into by conflating the events preceding the proposals to amend the Constitution with the actual proposal to amend the Constitution by the Constitution Amendment Bill 2020 um, yes, by the Constitution Amendment Bill 2020. Anything that preceded that bill we submit 
that proposed the contested amendments and upon which one million plus signatures were appended are irrelevant in our view and extraneous for purposes of evaluating compliance with Article 257 of the Constitution. With respect, therefore, the Court will appreciate and we so urge that the findings of the learned judges of the Court of Appeal specifically embodied in the final order number five of the impugned judgment that the President cannot initiate amendments to the Constitution was premised on a grave misdirection that the events preceding the Constitution Amendment Bill 2020 and the one million signatures were constitutional acts or events contemplated under Article 257 of the Constitution. Very quickly, on the second question as to whether the second, uh, second schedule to the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 is unconstitutional, my lords, the argument that an amendment to any provision of the Constitution, let alone Article 89, can be unconstitutional merely because the same seeks to disturb the status quo cannot in light of the broad and permissive provisions of Article Chapter 16 of the Constitution stand. That argument is founded on the erroneous and very absurd proposition that Article 89 of the Constitution is unamendable and cannot be disturbed, not even by the sovereign. As already submitted to your lordships, the learned judges of both the High Court and the Court of Appeal have held unequivocally that the Constitution of Kenya has no eternity clauses and that every clause is amendable. To that extent, a, pro a proposal to amend what is amendable cannot be said to be unconstitutional. The effect of insulating Article 89 as an unamendable clause would be to elevate the IEBC above the Constitution and substitute it for the sovereign. It is a trite principle of constitutional interpretation and application, my lords, that constitutional provisions cannot contradict or override one another. In fact, this court has in the decision of Speaker of the Senate and another versus the AG and others, advisory opinion reference number two of 2013, held that a constitution as an, as an embodiment of compromises is by its very nature not a stranger to internal contradictions and conflicts. And what that means is that where such contradictions arise, it would be within the judici ju judiciary's remit to interpret and harmonize them as the body with the ultimate power and authority to do so. And this was best il illustrated by the Court of Appeal in the case of Attorney General and another versus Andrew Kiplimo, Sang, Muge, and two others, where the Court of Appeal reconciled the apparent conflict as to the date of the general election under the current constitution and thereby, thereby underscored the court's authority and duty to interpret and harmonize the conflicts in the constitution. For these reasons, my lords and my ladies, and those detailed in our submissions, we urge that the Honorable Attorney General's appeal be allowed. I thank you. My lady, the Chief Justice, and the Honorable Judges of the Court with the kind permission, my name is Arnold Chengo Ginga. I wish to address the Court on two key issues. That is issue number five, as identified by the Honorable Court in its ruling, that encapsulates the twin issues on public participation and the role of IEBC under 2574, and issue number seven, that is the, on the question of whether a multiple or single question referendum. Just before I begin, let me point out that the question of public participation was addressed by the Court of Appeal judges and the majority bench of the Court of Appeal agreed with the High Court that there was no public participation. In the judgment, in the majority judgment by the president that is contained at paragraph 345, then in the second judgment by Lady Justice Nambuye, that is contained at order number four of her ladyship's judgment, then in the judgment but by Justice Kiage, that is contained at pages 133 to 134 onwards, and finally, in the judgment by Justice Gatembu, that is contained at paragraph 91 
of the learned judge's decision. So that as I begin, my lady and my lords, let me submit first that the English language is not an instrument of mathematical precision. But when it comes to interpreting words and phrases in the Constitution, the courts must give meaning to such words and phrases as intended in the Constitution, my lords. So that in this court's decision, this court has affirmed the concept of a holistic interpretation of our Constitution. So that for that proposition, I refer the court to reference number one of 2012, that is in the matter of the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, where at paragraph 26, this court was emphatic when it pointed out that a holistic interpretation of the Constitution does not mean an unbridled extrapolation of discrete constitutional provisions into each other so as to arrive at a desired result. So that in that context, my lady and my lords, examining the provisions of our Constitution, the court will note that the court that the framers of the Constitution intended to use the phrases in regard to the involvement of the people differently. So that in that context, if you look at Article 10, the language used in our Constitution is participation of the people. Comparing that to Article 89, subclause 7a, the language used in that provision is consult, where it says the Commission shall consult all interested parties. Again, comparing the same to Article 118, first it will be noted the title to Article 118 is Public Access and Participation. Again, comparing the same, my lady and my lords, to Article 196. Again, the title used is Public Participation, that is within the context of the county assemblies. Again, the language used under Article 174C of our Constitution is participation of the people. Now it doesn't end there again, my lords and my ladies. If you look at Article 256.2 of the Constitution, the language used is that Parliament shall facilitate public discussion. Again, to compare the same with Article 257, it says county assemblies, the bill shall be forwarded to the county assemblies for consideration. So that under chapter 16, the language used is not public participation. Now, the upshot of my submission is that, number one, public participation within the context of an enactment of legislation cannot be equated to the participation of the people within the constitutional amendment context. Secondly, the courts ought not to use the phrase public participation loosely because that was not the intention of the framers of the Constitution. Again, third, I submit that the role of public participation and participation of the people under Article 257 is to enable the people make a decision on whether to accept or reject a bill. Unlike in the normal legislative process where public participation calls for the inclusion of the principles in the Robert Gakuro case. Now, on that note, I finally submit that the use of the different phrases on the, on the involvement of the people in our constitution was intentional and was not by mistake. And the framers intended that said phrase to be interpreted as such. Now, the foregoing leads me to the twin question in, re in, relation, in relation to issue number two. Then how then do you determine whether there has been adequate public participation and participation of the people within the constitution amendment process? And the answer to that question, my lords and my ladies, lies in the decision by Lady Justice Jamwea, as she then, she then was, that is in the decision of Republic versus County Assembly of Kirinyaga where her ladyship at paragraph 56 of that decision rendered the position that number one, the effect or lack of public participation can however only be determined 
upon the conclusion of the process in Article 257. Then our leadership concludes by pointing out that it may be, it may be necessary to consider the cumulative efforts of public participation before deciding on its sufficiency or otherwise. Now, quickly to summarize my points on public participation, my lords, the court will note that the judges did not address their minds on the question of the over 4 million persons who signified the support of the bill at the initial stages. Then number two, the Court of Appeal in the majority decision erroneously uses Tana River County as a yardstick to measure the extent of public participation. On that point, let me point out that the question of whether or not there was adequate public participation at the county assemblies or the National Assembly, it was not one of the issues that was pleaded in the petition. And at the time of the hearing of the petitions, the process was still ongoing. So that my other submission would be that it was even premature for the courts to draw the conclusion that there was no or there was inadequate public participation and yet the process had not yet been concluded. Again, it is on record that even the court itself, the judiciary, gave views on the bill and participated in the public participation process. Due to time, my Lord, let me conclude by stating I urge the court to uphold and affirm the position so that one germane issue in this appeal that has emerged from the earlier submissions is the question of certainty in law. So that this court in the decision of Albert Chaurembo was emphatic that certainty in law makes for uniformity in the administration of justice and prevents the unbridled discretion of the state organs mandated to perform judicial and quasi-judicial functions. Finally, let me conclude by saying that justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done. And the courts of law ought not to interpret and apply the law in a manner that would lead to a predetermined outcome, thereby negating already determined precedent on constitutional questions. I beg to rest at that point. Chief Justice, my ladies and my lords, uh, I have two minutes and I want to make the following point briefly. That the Constitution is not a, ment uh, a mental construct. The Constitution is not an academic abstraction. The Constitution is the document the Kenyan people gave themselves to to manage their affairs. And Ms. Uh, Madam Chief Justice and uh, my ladies and my lords, uh, in answer to the question, as, uh, on, of, uh, the question of amendability or uh, non-amendability, looking at Article 255, Sub-Article 1, if you My Lord, and, uh, my Chief Justice, I understand I've been given five minutes by the AG. I don't know whether they can confirm <laughs> that to be the case. <laughs> yeah, I was, <laughs> I was beginning to think how I'll, I'll rush over this point, but I, I'm grateful. Um, in his address earlier, and which I wish to associate Let's myself... Let's get that. You got the five minutes from... The from the Senate. Senate. Five minutes from the Senate. From the Senate. Yes. I'm grateful. My Lord and my ladies, the two decisions by the High Court and the Court of Appeal was a case of usurpation of the sovereignty of the people and a judicial overreach. And I'll state the reasons why I say so. If you look at Article 255, Sabbatical of the Constitution, and I like the words that uh, 
my learned friend Mr. Paul Mwangi used and consider which are the sacrosanct provisions of the Constitution. My lords and my ladies, what is more sacrosanct than the supremacy of the Constitution? What is more sacrosanct than the sovereignty of the people? What is more sacrosanct than the Bill of Rights? And yet you find these provisions in Article 255 of the Constitution that makes those provisions amendable. So long as the procedural and constitutional processes under Article 255, 2, 256, and 257 are undertaken. Um, there used to be uh, an old uh, philosopher in Britain called Samuel Johnson. There was a contest between subjective idealism and realism. And the idealists believed that uh, uh, reality was a mental construct. It was merely a perception. And uh, Samuel Johnson um, convinced those with whom he was having an argument that if you want to prove that a stone exists, just kick it. Uh, don't involve yourself in an argument whether the stone exists or, or not. So in this, the question that is before the court is as to whether the impugned provisions of the constitutions are amendable or not amendable. And my ladies and my lords, you'd find under Article 255, sub Article 1, that, that even the most sacrosanct provisions of the Constitution are amendable so long as uh, you determine which path you follow, whether it is by popular initiative or by uh, parliamentary initiative. I am saying that uh, it is a usurpation, usurpation of the sovereignty of the people because it means that any time the people would desire to, to amend the Constitution, that path will be uh, through a minefield uh, at the time of origination of the process uh, to its conclusion. I think that power, the court should be very careful uh, and exercise judicial restraint so that in terms of this constitution which gave sovereignty to the people of Kenya, we do not, that uh, power of the sovereign is not usurped, usurped by dint of uh, judicial uh, craft. Now, the other thing that uh, we wanted to point out in, and is in our submissions, Constitutions follow so many paths. If you look at the history of many constitutions, they have come through revolutions, they have come through uh, military coups, they have come through an uprising of the people and so on. But the sovereign, in Kenya, the sovereign, which is the people in Kenya, set out clearly that in whatever circumstances they desired to change any provisions of the constitution, there was uh, a process, a constitutional process, and a constitutional path uh, to achieve uh, that uh, desired end. And therefore, any steps taken prematurely to interfere with the exercise of that sovereign authority, I think that would be a case of uh, judicial uh, overreach. And one would want to look at the history of Kenya, the process of constitution making, uh, that uh, we went through many paths, including the uh, deliberations at Lancaster, in, in, including the amendments, including the constitution making a, a, a process through a, a constituent assembly, as it were, the CKRC. And finally, when we came with this constitution, uh, the path was that the proclam proclamation of this constitution would uh, be after the people themselves had made a decision through a process that involved the people uh, at every time and an instance. And therefore, it would be to rewrite the Constitution, to read into the Constitution what is not in the Constitution. 
And I think if we take that path, then we obviously will be creating tension. Uh, they are, we used to tensions between the executive uh, and the other arms of, the, uh, of government, like parliament or, or, or the, the judiciary but have a tension between the people and any arm of the government where the people are stopped either by uh, legislation which uh, goes out of the constitutional uh, remit or by decisions that stop the people from exercising their right. I think that would be giving ideas to Kenyans to find out another path to reach their desired end in changing the, the constitution that, as my learned friend Mr. Rara said at the beginning, by reading the preamble, I think the preamble to this constitution is very important, that this constitution is enacted by the people and given, the people have given this constitution to themselves. And the powers exercised by all arms of government, including uh, the judiciary, is a delegated authority. And therefore, uh, we would urge the court to allow the two appeals by the Attorney General and the IBC and to dismiss the appeal by Mr. Morara Omoke. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much. There is one party, Firista Wakesho, our reading of uh, our submissions is that she supports the first and the second appellant, uh, but she appears within the group that uh, was in the High Court called the Third Way Alliance. The Third Way Alliance. So we had allocated one hour to that um, group of respondents. So you will have 15 minutes for on behalf of uh, Firista Wakesho. That is correct, Your Ladyship. Actually, yes. I wanted to intimate to the court that I discussed with my colleague, Elias Mutuma, representing the Third Way Alliance. And we agreed that since he's involved in so many issues, he would take the 45 minutes, then I would utilize the 15 minutes. Okay. So I think that is very correct okay. in order, Lady Chief Justice. Your name, please. So now, for the record, record, my name is George Gilbert, Lady Chief Justice, mm -hmm. and I appear for the 74th. Say, say, say that again. My name is George Gilbert. George Gilbert. And I appear for the 74th respondent. Now, because of the limited time, your lordships, I am going to handle two issues. And number one, it is important to start by stating that I fully support the appeals by the Attorney General. I also fully support the appeal by the IEBC. I disagree with the appeal as filed by Mr. Omoke Morara, my learned colleague. Now, in relation to my support to the appeals, I am more interested in issue number one on the basic structure in terms of my highlighting, and then issue number seven on the referendum questions. As I start to take it on the basic structure, my lords, it is important that I bring something that I believe is very much important to context before this court. In the case, celebrated case of Kasevenanda. Your Lordship, in this case, there is one important thing that has not been told before this case, which seems to be the, the leading case in terms of the basic structure. The issues that were in context in that case were issues of land reforms introduced by the state of Kerala in India. Laws were introduced by the parliament which sought to alter the rights of private individuals who are large landowners in terms of how they are supposed to manage and utilize their lands. Kasevenanda himself was a head of a monastery and so thought under Article 26 of the Indian Constitution that he was convinced by a very important jurist in the Indian country to go to court and seek a reprieve that the amendments that were proposed by the parliaments were not in order. 
the amendments that were proposed by the parliament to change the constitution did not talk only about the land reforms. While the constitution being interpreted by that government talked about interpretational change in terms of forming the basic structure of the constitution and saying that that basic structure could not be interfered with, there was another issue in that case known as the directive principles. Directive principles, which is mentioned in Article 36 to 51 of the Indian Constitution. Now, those principles, despite the, the amendments being omnibus, the court held that those ones are okay, the parliament could amend them. Comparing that with the current situation, the courts in this country, both the High Court and the Court of Appeal, said that everything that was proposed to be amended, they stopped the amendment of everything. And that is where the problem is. Now, when you look at the context of the basic structure, in the Indian constitution, it emanates from Article 368 of the Indian Constitution, Article 368 of the Indian Constitution. The said article gives power to Parliament to amend those constitution the way it deems fit. However, insofar as it does not touch the basic structure of the Constitution. In the Kasevenanda case, it was found that what we call the direct principles sorry, the, the directive principles did not touch the basic structure of the constitution, and that was said that they could go ahead and amend that. Your Lordship, the, direct, the directive principles simply talked about issues to do with environmental protection, protection of monuments, and administrative issues. What we are putting in context is that court identified some things and said these ones cannot form the basic structure. Going forward today, do we have those things that consistently a Kenyan can stand up and say, this forms the basic structure and this do not form the basic structure? There lies the, co the confusion and the lack of consistency as submitted by my senior, senior counsel, George Uraro, where he said that in the high court, the court pronounced itself that basic structure will be decided on a case-to-case -case basis. When we came to the Court of Appeal, some of the learned judges posited that 255.1, the provisions under Article 255.1, would form what essentially would be the basic structure. Now, if you put that in context, you find a very important confusion that cannot let a Kenyan move forward in terms of constitutional amendment. Now, that brings me to the important case of Kivuitu versus Kivuitu, which is cited by the Attorney General, I think it is in page 142 to 182 of their volume two bundle of authorities. Your Ladyship, as I go into that case, it is important that I set out this with precision that my context of submission in terms of the basic structure is that the constitution of Kenya has a basic structure, but the principle and the doctrine of basic structure is not applicable. There is a distinction. I submit that the Constitution of Kenya basic structure is found at Article 255, 1, and they are listed from A to J. Your Ladyship, I will not go into the details because exactly that is exactly what Senior Counsel James Orengo just submitted immediately before he sat down. And he asked this question, 
What is more important in this country than the supremacy of this constitution? He also asked you, what is more important in this country than the Bill of Rights? Your Lordship, we submit that there is nothing more important in this constitution than those listed in Article 255, 1A to J. Your Lordships, I want to adopt the submissions in relation to the physical design and physical architecture of this constitution. Your Ladyship, the constitution starts by showing us the preamble. And that preamble, there is something very important on the preamble because it talks about the sovereign who are the people of Kenya. Then when it leaves the preamble, it goes to the republic, the citizenship, meaning the constitution as drafted goes step to step with each preceding provision and article feeding into the next one. The finality is that we end at chapter 16, which is the, substanti which is the substantive provision of the constitution, because after that, we go to the transitional provisions. And when it gets to chapter 16, now the constitution, the constitution considers that we have discussed everything that is important in this Republic of Kenya, but the most important thing is supposed to come. And what is that, Your Ladyship? The most important thing is how to amend this constitution. to set a very important distinction between this constitution and the constitution of India is that, as I said before, their Article 368 finds a twin sister in our Article 256. Because those are the articles that talk about parliamentary initiative. Article 255 of the Constitution of Kenya does not have a twin sister in the Indian constitution. And there lies the difference. I will adopt the submissions of senior counsel George Oraro when he said that when making constitutional interpretation and importing something from another country, you cannot copy paste that without looking at the exact provision if it is a twin provision to our country. I submit that Article 255, 1A to J does not exist in the Indian Constitution and therefore the case of Kazavananda does not arise. Your Lordships, I also submit that when this Constitution was created, designed and crafted, a consideration was made of the developmental stages of constitutional amendments over time. With that, I'll refer you to paragraph 159 of the case of Kivuitu, where this is what the court said. In a country like ours, which has a history of disrespect for the sanctity of the Constitution, the jurisprudence propagated in Joya 2 case was necessary. It goes on to say, this may explain why the people of Kenya are aware of the frequent and the frivolous amendments to the repealed Constitution provided for Article 255 of the 2010 Constitution. This case was cementing the position that this article was meant to stop what I would call mad amendments of the Constitution, what other people call dismemberment of the Constitution. So that said, you can amend as long as you take it to the referendum if it involves issues that 
from the basic structure under Article 255, 1 at J. You can amend. The course decreed at, at paragraphs 160, the case goes on to say, Your Lordship, it is clear from the above cited provision, they are referring to provision number 255, that's Article 255, that there are amendments that can only be done with the involvement of the citizens by way of a referendum. And it lists those amendments as 255-1. Popular initiative involving at least 1 million registered voters. Your ladyship, your lords, this constitution is amendable. I beg you to find a lot of solace and persuasion from those provisions. And I'd like you again to consider what the court in Kivuitu says in paragraph 158 again, where they reiterate the persuasion by Ringera J. in Joya 2 by holding that an amendment that upsets the basic structure of the constitution could not be effected by parliament without involving the people. That's the referendum, your leadership. I close that line of submission to hold that basic structure is not applicable as a doctrine, but the Constitution of Kenya has the basic structure doctrine and can be amended through a referendum by the people. I want to talk about issue number seven within one minute, and I'm sure I'll manage of the issues raised by the court in terms of the issue of setting of referendum questions. And my line of argument is simply that that issue was not ripe for discussion by both the High Court and the Court of Appeal. I submit that until the IEBC reached that extent to start doing that which they, they were supposed to do by presenting it to the people, they cannot be faulted. Because doing any other thing is judging them based on speculations. And the court of law can only deal with facts before it and not speculations by parties. I rest my submissions and let court adopt the other rest of my written submissions. As filed in court. I have seven seconds which I donate back to court. Thank you, Your Lordship. Uh, thank you very much. Is there any other respondent who is supporting the first and the second appellant? Mm -hmm. Our list shows uh, 254 hope. The 10th respondent is partially here and there. I don't know. May it please the Honorable Court. My name is Dr. Eboso, and uh, I was not prepared to be giving my, my submissions today, but I think I, I could go ahead and uh, try to beat the time. So um, as you rightly put it, um, as you rightly put it, uh, 254 HOPE uh, does not fully support the appeals by the appellants, neither does it fully oppose. We support it to an extent and oppose it to an extent, and uh, we will highlight and uh, we'll be able to demonstrate to what extent we support it and uh, the support. Um, the basic structure doctrine appears nowhere in the uh, um, 
is false for the reason that doctrine in being an implied provision means you will not see it. You will have to look into the other express provisions in order to pick out an implied provision in the constitution. of power. KTN News. Get the whole story.